Hey, it's Jay. The next two episodes come as a pair, and this is part one uh, of a conversation with the philosopher of mind and author Keith Frankish. So let's get right to it. Imagine that you've been invited to a small gathering where you were promised you would see something incredible. A few chairs are set up in front of a small stage. Your fellow guests murmur with curiosity and excitement. You take a seat and the spotlight appears on stage. A man comes on and silently takes a seat. He places what appears to be an ordinary apple on a table. He announces that with the power of his mind, he will lift the apple into the air. You watch as he merely looks at the apple for a moment and it ascends into the air floating and the audience gasps. The apple gently floats back down to the table and the man exits the stage and the stunned audience looks on. So now you in the audience have three different ways to proceed thinking about this thing that you just witnessed. One way would be to conclude that telekinesis is possible and it must not break the laws of physics, but clearly we are so badly mistaken about our understanding of these laws that we have to throw out nearly all scientific knowledge and go about the business of discovering the new laws which would explain how this is possible. Another way to think about it is to take a similar approach, but instead of throwing out all of the knowledge of physics, you conclude that there must be some aspect of it that we don't understand quite well enough. Perhaps there's some capacity of the electromagnetic force that we've overlooked somehow, or something that would explain how the apple floated. Both of these ways are realist responses. They're called realists simply because they take it that the telekinesis which was witnessed was real in the sense that it really truly happened as described and it demands an explanation as to make its nature consistent with the rest of reality. The third option though is to deny that telekinesis actually truly happened. So it wasn't real, but that it merely seemed to have happened. And the thing which demands an explanation is just how that illusion is produced. This is the thought experiment which Keith Frankish sets out for us to describe the stance of illusionism. He wants us to apply this stance to the notion of consciousness. Now, if you are very skeptical at this point, don't worry, you aren't alone. Most people get turned off by what I've just laid out, and Frankish himself admits that he has trouble sometimes getting people to return for the second lecture. You are actually going to hear me over the course of these two episodes have some epiphanies about what illusionism really is. And by the end, I am fully on board, which actually surprised myself. But what was important for me to understand is exactly what part or aspect of consciousness that Frankish is calling an illusion. Let me very briefly lay out the playing field here for those who are new to the subject of consciousness. David Chalmers, you you may have heard of him, described for us what he called the hard problem of consciousness. If you look at consciousness, I'm sure you'll find this. And in short, David Chalmers was describing the hard problem as the problem of having to explain just why any physical state is conscious or has a something that it is likeness quality, which is delivered immediately for a subject which experiences it. Chalmers imagined the now famous philosophical zombie thought experiment, and the philosophical zombie was a being which is identical to a human, but lacks this sense of this, this what is it likeness experience on the inside. The lights are just off, even though it claims that they are on. It doesn't have the subjective, private, ineffable, seemingly s- eternal experience of of something like pain, even though it writhes in what appears to be agony when you torture it. Um, (laughs) This peculiar aspect of experience, this, this what is it likeness, which can only be known from the inside, is called phenomenal consciousness. And this is exactly the part that illusionists like Keith Frankish call an illusion. 
So he's not exactly saying consciousness is an illusion, but it's that's what he means by consciousness, although we'll get into it because in a sense he means phenomenal consciousness is what people mean by consciousness. So in that sense, it would be an illusion. So this is the part, focus on phenomenal consciousness. This is the part that we shouldn't be focusing on explaining any more than we should be focusing on explaining telekinesis. Because telekinesis did not really happen on that stage, even if it appears to have happened. And the same goes for the particular part of your experience, which appears to be private, ineffable, purely subjective, and somehow metaphysical. If you are still protesting and insisting that you are right now performing the experiment which disproves this stance by having a phenomenal conscious experience of Uh, a color or taste or smell or memory or pain that's near you right now. Well, I hear you. That's where I was. But stick with this. Frankish attempts to be as precise as possible with what he means. There is a lot of confusion in conversations on consciousness and free will, which have been exported to the public. Most of the time, the participants are simply talking about different things, or one is talking about something very specific while the other is speaking in generalities. If you're familiar with the uh, dead-end conversations between Sam Harris and Dan Dennett on this subject, you'll know what I mean. Frankish works with Dan, and we both reference their famously confused encounters often in this two-part episode. Um, So here you go. I I really can't tell you how much I enjoyed this conversation. Uh, The thrill of feeling your conception of a perplexing idea change in real time is like one of the most exhilarating things for me. Uh, And you're going to hear me do it (laughs) in these two parts. So in the end, I felt clearer and closer to reality than I had at the start. So I just love that. And I was surprised because I was very much in the camp, which insisted that consciousness is the only thing which can't be an illusion when my investigation started. So, well, Let me just play it out and you can hear why I now understand that statement to miss the mark quite badly and maybe also be doing us quite a disservice about making progress on this eternal problem of consciousness. In some ways, I'll give you a little spoiler. The hard problem is actually the impossible problem and illusionism is a way to actually set it aside, think clearly and really get some work done. So here you go. Part one outlines exactly what is meant by illusionism. And uh, part two, which I'll release next week, gets into some of the possible implications for it, uh, for science, society, and morality. Uh, it's, it's really fun. So here is Keith Frankish, who uh, is currently an honorary reader at the University of Sheffield in the UK, and he's a visiting research fellow with the Open University. So Keith Frankish, part one, illusionism. Enjoy. As you know, with this topic, uh, it's, I don't know the place to start. There's never a good place to start. I'll tell you, it's like my favorite subject is theory of mind and consciousness. Um, And I do this thing where when I encounter a new sort of corner and way to think about it and way to understand it or or investigate it, I become immediately convinced by it (laughs) because they all sound right to me and they all sound equally crazy to me. Um, So the last few days I've been, yeah. Perhaps for the next 60 minutes, you'll be persuaded. By, no, I, well, that's by, the thing. I, I think the last few days I've been binging on, of course, your work and the work of, of what is called illusionism. Um, and I love it. So I'm convinced. I'm, I'm already on board. <laughs> so where I keep tripping up on it is, and, and I know there are some people who don't like the word illusionism for precisely mm-hmm. the confusion that I'm feeling, but it seems the antonym of the word illusion is real. And so... Mm-hmm. If I, you know, I have a cup of coffee here and if I, if I take a sip, I have uh, what we call phenomena, a phenomenal experience or phenomenal consciousness of this, this taste of coffee um, mm-hmm. that appears to be a private experience for me and ineffable. It's trapped inside mm-hmm. myself. Um, mm-hmm. and, and I can get on board with saying the part of my experience that is ineffable or private is the illusion part but but even if that's an illusion what is real about my experience with that cup of coffee and that taste of coffee something important is happening that's undoubted 
one way I like to do this is by contrasting conscious perception with unconscious perception. Mm. Okay. So it's pretty widely known now that we can perceive things without being aware that we're doing. We can pick up information through our senses without being aware that, we're, that it's happening. Um, there's cases like subliminal perception. An image is flashed before your eyes for a very brief time. You're not aware of seeing it, but it can influence your reactions later, the way you classify words and sound later. More in a more everyday level, we're, we're kind of all the time we're taking in information about the situation around us, think about driving or something like this, without our being consciously aware of it. It's kind of maybe maybe it's kind of available to consciousness in some way, but it's it's sort of being it's kind of under the radar most of it. I think this is pretty pretty easy to accept. And that contrasts with cases where you're really attending to what you're seeing. Like when you took that sip of coffee coffee there because you wanted to make the to use it as an example, you attended to what it what it tasted like. If you'd just been busy working on something else, maybe, and you just picked up the cup and taken a swig and put it down, you might not have been consciously aware of the taste. I think that's a, quite a natural thing to say. Mm. And of course, there are cases um, uh, of uh, pathological cases, such as blind sight, where people seem to be able to, to perform quite quite well on, on certain sorts of visual tasks, admittedly fairly simple tasks, uh, even though they can see nothing at all consciously. They've certain da damage to certain areas of the visual cortex, and to them they seem completely blind in a certain area of their visual field, but they can, if they're asked to guess what's there, um, in fairly simple terms, whether it's whether there's something vertical or horizontal, say, in front of them. They can do it pretty well. They can even catch a ball that's thrown in that area sometimes. Mm -hmm. So now we can say then consciousness, what's, uh, the distinctive thing about conscious experience is whatever separates those unconscious cases, subconscious perception, from full-blown attentive conscious experience. That's what we're trying to explain, whatever that difference is. I think everyone can agree on that. Mm -hmm. that there is a substantive difference there and that consciousness is what makes the difference. Now the question is, what is that? And one way to spell it out is, well, it's this, there's this kind of inner, <laughs> this inner phenomenal feel to the experience. There's this what it is likeness to the experience that is private to us that you can't experience mine and I can't experience your inner phenomenal world. And now things start to get a little bit more... It's, I mean, that seems perfectly natural to start like that, but just think about it for a moment. Say... An example, the examples that are often used are colours. So we say to someone, look at that beautiful blue sky or this, um, this tomato that's here in front of you and concentrate on, the, on what it's like to see it. Now, I think most people's sort of pre-theoretical, pre-philosophical response is to say, well, the colour that I'm seeing there, it's a feature of the outside world. The colour, the blue is somehow up in the sky, the, the red is on the surface of the tomato. Mm -hmm. But we kind of know that that's not right because after all things look different to different people and different creatures with different mm -hmm. sens uh, sensory apparatus see things through the world differently and we know that really what's out there is it's kind of just electromagnetic radiation bouncing off surfaces and being selectively reflected different wavelengths reflected mm -hmm. that's kind of all that's really out there these colors aren't actually out there painted on the world so where are they well then they must be in our minds this is this is the inner phenomenal world this is the world of consciousness and it's because in some cases these light rays trigger this inner phenomenal feel of redness when they bounce off the tomato and in other cases they don't for some reason mm -hmm. that's the difference between unconscious and conscious perception in the one case say where you, you don't consciously attend to the, to the tomato the, the light rays bounce off the, tomato, the surface of the tomato they hit your eye, they trigger all kinds of reactions maybe in you mm. but somehow they don't switch on this inner redness <laughs> that makes that's the distinctive of the conscious experience of the tomato and in other cases they do yeah and we could in principle imagine a creature that has all the same reactions to those light rays as we do but none of this inner world at all so it behaves exactly like us it reacts to stimuli exactly like us it classifies things exactly like us it describes things as being red but it's just reacting to the light rays as well without as it were without this inner world this, this inner is world sort of the the famous chalmers philosophical zombie the, in a way the, yeah. the zombie. Right. Yeah. and that's now we're fully into the, the problem of consciousness mm -hmm. and once you have this way of setting it up this is my analogy with the, the this is um, what 
the, um, uh, the uh, psychokinesis example is meant to be an analogy for. Right. Now you've set this up now in the way that the magician has set up uh, the, uh, the, uh, the demonstration of psychokinesis. And we have three, again, we have three choices. We can say, yes, there is this kind of private inner world of mental colors, mental sounds, mental tastes, mental versions of the things that we ordinarily take to be out there in the world. Because we know that kind of science tells us they're not really out there. The taste isn't really in the coffee. There's just molecules and stuff. That mm -hmm. The taste is in us. It's, it's this inner world. That's what makes the difference between unconscious and conscious perception, these inner qualities. And now we have this, this choice. We can say, can we explain that in standard scientific terms, in terms of the sort of apparatus, theoretical apparatus, that cognitive scientists are currently using to explain other aspects of the mind? Mm -hmm. Do we have to go in some radical direction and posit new properties and forces that previously science had not known about? Or could we possibly say that it's something like an illusion, that it's not quite what it seems, that that initial picture of this in private inner world isn't right? Right. So yeah, the, if I can jump in there, because this is sure, like, absolutely. The, yeah, this is, I mean, it's fantastic. I guess actually we probably sh the way we maybe should attack this is, is lay out illusionism in a way. And then I think it's, uh, I, I'll, I'll ask you flat out, I guess, even now, like, is the <laughs> reading your work and getting into an illusion, illusionism, it seems half of the motivation for doing it is because we all want some damn progress on these questions. <laughs> and it seems that by demanding it's an illusion and making this firm positive stance, we can actually uh, have the courage to move forward with confidence that we can answer some of these questions. Um, it, it, it seems like that, that's half the battle is to hold that line. It, it, there's an explanatory gap when you, w w when you fold in sort of the what is it likeness kind of qualia that that is unleapable and maybe potentially always unleapable because because mm -hmm. it's it, it's not a real question is almost the illusionist thing it's if this analogy works and i love that to, to save the word illusion and, and and where it started to kick in for me as a way is like if i'm staring at a necker cube which for mm -hmm. those who don't know is just like the you know when you draw on a chalkboard uh, something that looks like a three-dimensional cube but clearly it's just chalk on a, on a two-dimensional surface when i'm staring at a necker cube or like an M.C. Escher painting. You're looking at some sort of impossible object, like a infinitely downward staircase, but but it's just going around and around. And I'm looking at that thing. Uh, it, it's obvious that somewhere in my mind or somewhere I'm, I'm generating this thing, this impossible sort of object that is is clearly an illusion. And and. In that case, it's very clear that if we're going to approach the question scientifically of what is happening there is to say that we should not be demanding to ask where the three dimensional cube is because it's mm -hmm. not in the world. It is clearly right. an illusion and a trick. And maybe evolution could answer this as well as, you know, th th there's functions for it we could talk about of why is my brain playing that trick on me? And it's kind of mm. fun. We kind of like to notice it. But nobody mm. is ever demanding that you go find that three-dimensional cube somewhere out mm. in the world. And so is that kind of the same claim of like, well, consciousness itself and these crazy things called quality, you're asking an, an insane question to begin with. Right. Yes. I mean... The answer to that is, is, is yes, we need to be careful, of course, because as soon as you, you use that kind of analogy, people will respond, ah, yes, of course. Perceptual illusions like that are absolutely right. It would be wrong to go and look in the world, try and find this, this impossible object in the world. But of course, it exists in our minds. Mm. I mean, that's the, that, that we can't doubt, that it mm. exists in our, in our consciousness. And so when I start proposing that aspects of our consciousness might be an illusion too, then they say quite naturally, okay, so whose mind is, does that exist in? Whose consciousness does that exist in? You're going to have to posit a sort of another conscious mind, as it were, to have the to entertain the illusion of the first conscious mind, if you see. The idea is that to have to be under an illusion, to have a perceptual illusion, or I guess an introspective illusion, is to entertain something in consciousness. So if consciousness itself is an illusion, then you get into a sort of infinite regress of, yeah. of, of minds. Now I've got an answer to that. And I mean, it's, it would be a pretty pathetic kind of project if I didn't. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and I'll, I'll be happy to explain that. But yes, that is, the, that is 
Well, you use the word demand uh, a couple of times in setting that up, and I, I would want to pull back on that. I'm not demanding that this, I'm not suggesting that this is the, we must think of it this way. I mean, some people construe illusionism as a kind of, uh, they see it as being prompted by a kind of worship of science, devotion to science, that science doesn't seem to be able to explain these things. I think that, or oh, other illusionists think that science can explain everything, therefore we've got to deny anything that science can't explain. No, that's not the motivation at all. No. Not for me, anyway. It's more that this is an option which we should at least explore. Uh, we should, I mean, for some people, it's, 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 they just can't even you know, conceive of this being illusion, but let's try. It could, I think that a decent case can be made, a coherent case can be made for this kind of view. And that's what I'm trying to do, to make it, because I think if a decent case can be made for it, if it can be spelled out as a coherent option, then I think it's a very attractive option. Right. Because most of the other options involve positing all kinds of uh, radical, well, the, the radical realist position certainly involve positing all kinds of extensions to our current science that are really not motivated by anything other than the the desire to explain this peculiar feature of our own introspection. introspection. Right. That would include panpsychism or, or any kind of, um, you know, uh, dualism or metaphysical substance in, in, in some way interacting. Descartes kind of dead ends <laughs> is what I would call them. Uh, I, I don't want to be dismissive about them, but yes, I do think they are very costly in metaphysical terms. You have to, right. and, and also ex <laughs> extremely difficult if not impossible to test um uh, they the idea is you've got to find some kind of place for this weird <laughs> uh, uh, uh inner world you've got to explain how this weird inner world this well, let's just call it inner, this inner world is related to the outer world and how the two coexist i mean one option is to say well there isn't an outer world there's just the inner world some form mm -hmm. of idealism because we know we know the inner world is here we you know it's immediately presented to us the outer world is some sort of inference from that you could just drop that and then you've got, not got a problem of how they're related to each other another one is to sort of suppose that all of reality has a kind of inner, its own inner world panpsychic that even atoms have a, a sort of inner inner life like this but i think as they are very costly solutions to what is certainly a big problem that maybe seems bigger to us <laughs> from our perspective as the creatures who get it from thinking about their own minds, then maybe it, you know, maybe from a cosmic perspective, it's not quite such a big I mean, what, what are the costs the there? What, what are the costs of something like a panpsychic? To, to walk it through, and I'm just going to, you know, straw man mm -hmm. it, I'm sure, of course, but it's something like it, it's responding to David Chalmers' hard problem to answer the mm -hmm. philosophical zombie. And if I was building an exact replica of some human mm -hmm. over here, but out of just, you know, uh, inert matter or whatever, um, to avoid, if I could build something that was precisely like me, but the lights were off inside, I've built a philosophical zombie. And if you demand that this is impossible, that either consciousness just comes along for the ride, um, then then you sort of are forced into the corner of panpsychism because you're like, well, I just arranged all of these magical or, or these atoms in some per perfect pattern and then consciousness happened and I never added anything to it. And yeah. then you just reverse the process and being like, well, when it was just a bucket of parts, those parts must have had some mental properties or whatever you throw on top of that stuff. Um, that That's the sort of steel man, the argument of, of panpsychism. And if you go with that answer, what's cost... What, what are we losing there? What are the costs that we're paying there other than maybe that's all the progress you'll ever make and now I'm bored and we didn't solve any problems? I mean, Daniel Dennett has this lovely phrase. I think it was way back in his first book in 1968, uh, Content and Consciousness. He has this phrase, ontological bloat. <laughs> that you sort of, um, yep, uh, it's just... It's not an elegant picture, <laughs> and it's a barely comprehensible picture because I mean, they are, these properties are supposed to be the intrinsic properties of the fundamental particles, whatever they may be, of, of uh, the, the, whatever physics right. treats as fundamental. They're supposed to be the fundamental properties, but, and they're supposed to be like somehow like consciousness or perhaps a proto form of consciousness. They could either be phenomenal like our conscious experiences or proto forms of that. Mm -hmm. We, I mean, 
we can't get our minds around that. We, I mean, I, my panpsychists are you know, pretty open about this. That we, what would the experiences of, a, of an atom be like? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> are they all, are all, do all atoms have the same experience? Do they have different experiences? I, the thing is, for me, the notion of experience seems, in a, seems a, through and through a psychological one. It's a state of our minds where our minds are embodied control systems for bodies. The whole, you know, the mind isn't some sort of like, kind of like essence of, you know, psychic essence that pervades our brains. The brains are things that do jobs, that have psychological work to do in controlling us, and experience is part of that. And yes, okay, they could have some properties that are not, you know, that are sort of side effects of what they do. But to me, the, say something like pain doesn't seem like a side effect of anything it seems something very real that is doing something very important work mm. and that suggests to me that if we're thinking of it in a way that would enable it to be a, a side effect an epiphenomenon then we're thinking of it wrongly yeah that pain is something much more this is actually one of the motivations that i have for illusionism i think that I, i'm actually more realist in some ways about experience than the, the phenomenal realist, because the phenomenal realist construe experience as a sort of essence, as I just, uh, mm. as something intangible that is yeah, kind of yeah. attached to our mental states. I think of it, no, no, it's, 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 it's a functional state. It's something that's doing something. Pain is doing something very important and was selected, and the pain mechanisms were selected for, for you know, very good evolutionary reasons. Mm. It matters to us because it does something to us. It's yeah. not something that could be abstracted away without changing our behavior, yeah, as in a zombie. So it seems to and me, I'll also, in, in season one, I actually talked to Eric Howell, who worked with uh, Giulio Tononi right. on integrated information mm. theory. Mm -hmm. And it, it mm -hmm. seems to me the most interesting people trying to really forge ahead and make progress in what you're talking about do embrace this kind of, I would say, illusionism, as it were, although, although it's sort of agnostic to, to even panpsychism. But, but in almost the other way, I wanted to get to sort of your thesis. I know we've talked all about it, but we haven't just put the number or the, the names to it yet. Your um, your qualia thesis on sort of the three types i know we've we've danced around it already but the the um the, the diet qualia versus the zero sure. qualia which which i which is a which is a great term um but it we could walk through it if you want but but the punchline of that is this sort of to me is like an either or it's an you lay it out being like it's either chalmers or it's dennett it's either an illusion or it's <laughs> yeah. very very real and I'm rather convinced by that. I'm, I'm still in the moment of almost flipping a coin. And, and I think, yeah. so, so here's the, there's a line in your paper that I highlighted and picked out that like upon reading it first, as maybe a, a naive realist or physicalist, um, really upset me. And I kept reading it over and over being like, how does he not see this? And the more I, I got into it and got further into the paper and talking to you now, I, to I think I get it. And the line was, Illusionists deny that experiences have phenomenal properties and focus on explaining why they seem to have them. So a lot, uh, you probably already got it, but a lot of people are like, wait, no, yeah. Keith, the seeming is the consciousness. So like, what are you, yeah. what are you talking about? You're just, this is the famous like challenge to Dennett of when he wrote yeah. consciousness explained that actually it was consciousness denied. But, but yeah. I, yeah. but I, but I think, and let me try and then you'll answer it to, I think why you you wrote you wrote it carefully. I know you're careful with words and you wrote focus on explaining. It's not that you were hand waving it away. You said focus. And if you don't if you don't do what you do and focus on why they seem to have them, this whole idea of an illusion, um, and and you go through these things that we just talked about about panpsychism or whatever, mm -hmm. um, it, it, they seem like dead ends because maybe they are because they immediately get you at least to me to the point of like you said, you can't wrap your head around it and you're you're actually asking the ultimate question of why is there something rather than nothing almost immediately, which I think will, I think is an eternally unanswerable question that we just have to, if we're going to do anything, if we're going to make any progress or make any discoveries, you have to just put that one aside as far as I could mm -hmm. tell. <laughs> but by demanding it's an illusion or not, sorry, I use that word wrong again, <laughs> by suggesting that this Statistic. is a way to, right, suggesting that this is a way to investigate and think about our experiences here, you immediately can do a ton of interesting work. So I'm not I, mad at the right. line anymore. 
I, I mean, obviously, I've got to say what I mean by seem. Then, mm-hmm. now, if that seem builds in some sort of notion of presentation to phenomenal consciousness, mm. <laughs> then obviously I'd be in a in a in a in a in a, in a very bad position. Obviously, I don't mean that. I mean, if here's a sort of picture that you know, Dennett has this this, this conception of the Cartesian theatre, yes. the idea that you know, where sensory representations of the world are kind of presented for consciousness, right? So your senses do their work and pick up signals from the, you know, from the world, and they kind of process this, and then they sort of pull it all together and, and present it uh, to some sort of central system, Hom- which then in your head, yeah. homunculus in your head maybe, yeah. or you know, physical boss system in the brain that kind of appreciates it. <laughs> okay, now one way of thinking about what an illusion is is to say, well, what's happening when there's, say, the, the, the Necker cube or whatever it might be, is it's not really out there in the world, but it's there in your Cartesian theatre. Mm-hmm. So, obviously, you're having a hallucination. You're hallucinating a, you know, I'm hallucinating the, the tomato. It's not there in the world, but it's there in my Cartesian theatre. Now, I come along and say, ah, but the thing in your, your Cartesian theatre is an illusion. The thing in your Cartesian theatre is an illusion. So the natural response to that is to say, so you're saying there's a second Cartesian theatre mm. where images <laughs> of the first Cartesian theatre are presented. Okay. And if I were, then I would deserve a good deal of mockery, uh, which some people have you know, gone for. Now, of course, the response to that is that I don't buy the first picture of illusion. I don't think that when you hallucinate a tomato, there is an... It, uh, uh, an image of a tomato in an inner theatre showing, showing it. I don't buy that analysis of illusion at all. I think that having an illusion of a tomato is getting, is your having your sensory apparatus stimulated in the way that it's normal, that it's, that a tomato would normally stimulate it, and you're having a whole bunch of reactions to that that would be appropriate to the presence of a tomato. You're kind of being engaged with the world in a tom- red tomato way. Mm. Well, that doesn't at any point involve reconstructing some inner mental tomato. It just means being in a being tightly engaged with the world in a sort of cycle of sensitivity and reaction. We're constantly cycling se- uh, informational sensitivity, perceptual sensitivity, and reaction. And it means being in this kind of cycle, locked onto the world in this cycle. Uh, uh, mistakenly, in a, in a way that would be appropriate if there were a red tomato there, but there isn't. Mm. Similarly, having a sort of inner illusion means being kind of locked onto your own inner processes in a way that suggests they have a certain sort of character that they don't. It means reacting to your own, reacting introspectively as if there were certain features there that aren't really there. It's yeah. all in the reactions for me. I, I think to to sharpen that there was another part of your your argument because i'm tempted to say what if i could you you keep referring to it as an illusion there really is no reconstruction of this tomato in my in my theater in my mind Mm -hmm. um if i could somehow see through this illusion or conquer my illusion what would i experience Uh, i think you answered a little bit with with meditation and other kinds of forms of of a lack of a sense of self or something but is are you are you required with your theory to answer that question of you keep referring to this as an illusion so what if i could somehow conquer this illusion would that mean understanding the necker cube and 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 ceasing to see it as a 3d cube somehow is that possible is this an escapable illusion and if so does that matter i don't know them that's um, as i see it illusionism is a very broad research program and they're very there are many different particular theories that could be developed within that program. And one of the questions is, how does the illusion arise? I mean, what kind of illusion is it? How does it arise? Is it, some, is it due to deep features of the human brain, the human introspective mechanisms that are, that, that are common to all humans? Or is it due, does it, does it have a, a sort of learned component? Is it, is, it a, is it more prevalent in certain cultures than others? Mm. Is it, can you... Can you train yourself out of it i don't know i mean this is this is part of the program to investigate i mean it's almost like things seeing through the matrix somehow um you know it's on on some level i know with some emails back and forth um you're in contact with don hoffman and there's 
Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I'm curious if there's overlap between your two your two theories. His, his might be a big, uh, maybe a grand illusion, as you call it. It's it's a whole inversion of the hard problem in a way, um, w which is interesting. But but he writes about and it and it really it seems to dovetail with with illusionism, of just considering um, like a, a molecule that is the taste of vanilla which is like a crazy sentence to just say you know he, sh he shows like a here's a molecule here and and what is this thing and the molecule when interacted with apparently with our biological systems and i'll be try to be careful with my language as much as i can here but gives rise somehow the illusion as you would say i experience the illusion of the taste of vanilla when that molecule ap appears to interact with me um but that's like a crazy sentence to say, because like, what does it mean to say that the taste of vanilla is a molecule? Um, and, it, and is that is that uh, is that the same as saying, well, it's it, it's not really the taste of vanilla. This is just some illusion of the taste of vanilla. Or, or am I going too far with it that it actually somehow in some way concretely is the taste of vanilla? But my. Uh, access to it my perceived inner qualia of it is the part that is the illusion i guess i'm asking like i, I know we keep doing this like where is that taste of vanilla or or is it still well, just a, a silly question i know he inverts the entire the entire sort of question on us uh, yeah. yeah i mean he's he's a, in, in a way he's he's a fairly strong form of yeah. realist about about consciousness he thinks consciousness he is the, the thing, fundamental right, reality right. Uh, so he is like the person who, I mean, I don't know how this work in terms of my, uh, he certainly believes in uh, uh, psychokinesis. And in fact, he kind of thinks that that all of the other apparatus there, the, you know, the stage and everything, and the magician himself are really all products of psychokinesis, yeah. as it were. It's, it's, it's the, the illusion is the whole, it, what I call the illusion is, is real and is the whole of mm -hmm. reality. There's nothing else but consciousness. Um, now, you kept talking there about the taste yeah. of vanilla, and this is that is like talking about where is the psychokinesis, you know, uh, where is it, you know, where are the rays, the psychokinetic rays coming from? What's causing them? Are the psychokinetic rays just light ray waves or something? That's the question I'm trying to stop people mm -hmm. asking because, and let me just try and spell out this. I, this, the, I, I don't think I've really got across the key idea perhaps mm -hmm. yet i keep talking about it seeming as if we have these these phenomenal properties and people quite rightly get you know, puzzled by that how could it seem that i'm feeling pain if i if, if i seems i'm feeling pain then i am feeling pain um the, the appearance is the reality what i mean is something like this when we talk about ourselves feeling pain all kinds of things happen in us all sort we have all sorts of reactions uh, you don't need me to tell you what they are. They're physical reactions, um, physiological reactions, psychological reactions. You want it to stop. You feel unhappy. You feel distressed. You know, uh, stress hormones, the levels will rise. All sorts of things will happen, which we could, many of which we're uh, aware of, many of which we're not aware of. They're happening in our, in, our, uh, in our bodies and our brains without us being aware of it. But we're kind of aware of their overall effect. Think about all the effects that pain has. Now, we tend to sort of sum all this up by saying there was this pain and it sort of did all this. Now, imagine, and this, but the pain itself, when we try to trace it back, we say, is the pain just all those effects? Well, no, there was, the pain was something we were kind of aware of that caused all those effects. Well, there was something that caused all those effects. There was, say, damage to your body in a certain They Say you, somebody struck you hard on the shin. There was damage there in the nerve um, and pain signals along the, uh, the nerve pathways to your brain and there, so there was all that so there was all this sort of incoming stuff and then there was all this stuff on the outgoing side all the effects that I just talked about and then somewhere sandwiched in between that we tend to think of there being the pain the thing that was produced by this damage and these incoming signals and that caused all the outgoing mm. things okay and this pain itself seems <laughs> kind of hard to pin down and uh, uh, as we say, what is it like? Well, apart from describing the reactions and the causes, what are you left with? There was, and as you try and sort of narrow in on this thing, 
you know, separating it out from the reactions on the one side and the causes on the other, you seem to be left with something very strange and spooky that doesn't seem to have a place in the in the in the uh, sort of picture of all this that a, that a, a neuroscientist say would tell, or mm-hmm. indeed that we would tell if we just tried to describe it in terms of what's observably what what's actually um, the, uh, the observable causes and effects. And now this is this is where we're we're getting into this weird sort of metaphysical world of what question of what the pain itself is. What and oh, if, if you mentioned vanilla, you know, it could tell the same story about you know the sensitivity to the molecules of the, the vanilla and so on, and the reactions then the associations mm-hmm. that, that vanilla brings up for you and the, so, so. And again, now it's that thing that I'm kind of wanting to say is illusory that that intangible bit in the middle, because suppose we just knocked it out but left all the other processes. So we still had the damage to your body, say in the case of pain and all the incoming signals, and we still had all the reactions. It was still just as you wanted it to stop. It was producing all the, the signs of distress and so on and so forth. Everything was just, it mattered. <laughs> the thing still mattered to you in the same way. It was having all the same effects on you, but without this kind of intangible bit in the middle. Would that be any different? I mean, suppose you, I mean, I like to use this example, suppose you were going to have uh, an operation mm. which would be, you know, cause a lot of pain. And you offered two kinds of anesthetics. One will, one that you can take will knock out all the effects. Okay, so uh, you, won't, you won't have any sort of psychological awareness of what's going on. You won't react psychologically. You won't believe that anything bad is happening to you. You won't want it to stop. You won't co- conjure up any associations, negative associations. You won't have any emotional reactions. All these are psychological states, I'm assuming. Um, you won't struggle. You won't sweat. You'll just lie there peacefully, maybe thinking of uh, beautiful uh, experiences. You know, like maybe you're just thinking that you're lying there on the beach or something like that, feeling very calm and fine. But there will still be the quality there. The, the quality just the, the feel. It just won't cause any of this, any of the negative stuff. Mm. Okay? And the other one, the other uh, anesthetic, will not do anything to the effects. They, you will still react in every way, psychologically and physically, as if you were in great pain. But the quality itself, the feel of pain, the pit in the middle will be knocked out. Now, if you believe in in, in quality and think that they're, they're real, then you should those two yeah. scenarios should both be coherent to you, and you should be at least be able to imagine them. Now, of course, the the surgeon would prefer you to take the first one without a doubt. What would you prefer? Uh, are you? I mean, are you asking me? It's uh, it's not well, even. A, well, which would you prefer? Yeah, it's not even a clear answer to me. Um, but it should be very clear if I know you think the quality <laughs> is the is the real essence of the thing, and the reactions are I all. Should, just, I should not you know. want that. Yeah, no, you're right. Okay, if I, yeah, if that's somehow equivalent to some sort of yeah, like a conscious awareness of of the pain part itself, yeah, fine. I'll thrash around and I'll sweat, but if I don't feel anything, yes. If that's the if that's what you mean with the feels of the qualia, then yeah, knock that one out for me, and I'll but take that But my suggest. <laughs> My, my, well, my suggestion is that the, you know the thrashing around, the negative psychological reactions, and everything—that is the yeah. pain. That yeah. you know the, the, how you're engaging with your well, that, environment. That would certainly be that the test is, of your theory if we could somehow do it. <laughs> and if it, if it was still terrible, I would come out as a total devotee. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but of course, you wouldn't even be able to. Te- exactly. Suppose you'd 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 undergone that. I mean, one right. thing that wouldn't be happening in this case is that you wouldn't be laying down any memories of the thing either, because right. again, they are, they are effects. Are so effects. even if even if at each moment there was terrible pain, the second the, you know the, the second yeah. afterwards you'd have forgotten it, and so you'd certainly come around saying that was fine. I had absolutely no problem because no memory of it would have been left. The point is, as I like to say, pain is as pain does. If it's not having the effects of pain then you know it, what what does it matter your electrons are supposed to be ha- in this panpsychism picture they're supposed to be having right. some kind of conscious experience but it's not affecting their behavior i mean what does it matter pain that qualia are supposed to be the most kind of important thing in the world they're the, what the, the, according to some people these you know conscious experience con- conceived as as, as, as um, phenomenality mm-hmm. it's supposed to be the most important thing in the world the thing that grounds all the value and so on but it doesn't matter if it all switched off <laughs> overnight. We wouldn't notice because uh, it, you know, all it was provided. All the psychological effects stayed the same, 
we'd still if we became zombies we wouldn't know we were zombies we'd still think we had all the same zombies are now zombies are certainly under the illusion that they have conscious experiences that's agreed i think by pretty much everyone the, the, well they would report it right i mean so yeah how would they would a zombie in that in that experiment you just did uh which i like because i can imagine the input and the output and i'm just sandwiching in between mm-hmm. the zombie just doesn't never has that illusion of a middle uh, oh it does it, it yeah. has the illusion and in in when i say illusion i mean they it's, uh, they believe that they have it they, they they remember they have memories appropriate right. to it wait so, so sorry is the illusion itself in effect is that is that really yes. really the full claim okay i get it now so what else it, could it be what else could what it else be, could right? it be right so so an effect of uh, see the pain and the, and getting the whole operation is an illusion uh is the illusion that it was some sort of intrinsic private qualia painful experience right you know, right and this this is why i like the analogy with the stage magic because what right. word do do magicians illusionists use for what they're trying to produce they use the word effect right the effect they're trying to create on the audience they're trying to move the audience in a certain way make and that is exactly how i think about consciousness it's the effect on the rest of the system so the and, and then the way to, to maybe circle back to that one the way to um Maybe it's not necessarily seeing through this illusion or dispelling this illusion. It's to notice it as an illusion itself. Is uh, is this is something like a, pra- a meditation practice when people say, you know, dissolving the self and realizing mm-hmm. the self is an illusion? It, it, what you're saying is that is is, is that's precisely right. Is, is sort of this trick to turn off this fooling oneself into thinking that they are somehow I don't know separate from the world. Is that what it is? I mean, illusionism well, in a strange way actually seems to bring you closer to reality around you rather than separate you from it. I guess that's the theater uh, analogy. It's like, no, there is no theater. You're not watching anything. You just are. You, you are an effect of the universe. You are you are in it and it's affecting you and you're in some sort of infinite feedback loop, which just yes, ties you. to Yes. It, right? I do like that. I do. Um, I do like that idea. And I think that's one of the I don't think that moral considerations have any real relevance to um, uh, the truth or falsity of theories of consciousness. What's true is true, and we have to right. deal with it. But I do think there are some... Pl- and, and some people think illusionism has terrible consequences. They think I'm hmm. sort of kind of saying that people don't feel anything. They don't feel pain. I'm not. I'm saying that pain isn't what we think it is, but it's still real and important. And in fact, I think it's more important on this picture because, because it's rooted in... Pain is just a bunch of effects. And what I think it does is it does help to put us back into the world in a way and put us back in contact with other people. We're not sealed off from each other in private mental worlds Mm -hmm. that are not part of the physical world and that are somehow, you know, we're not each in our little isolated bubble of consciousness. No, we're we're there in the world. And if I, one thing that's, one consequence of this, I think, is that there's nothing radically private. If I could really know you, really know your reactions how you react to things your, your the associations that things conjure up for you the, the the detailed emotional impact that things have on you um if i could be completely sensitive to your reactions in the way that you know you are sensitive to the world then i could n- know you uh, mm. as well or perhaps even better than you know yourself and i think in some cases in cases of couples who are very um devoted to each other something like this happens and I, I like this picture. I think it's a comforting picture that we're not isolated. Yeah, but it, but but that that is, that isn't a reason for believing the right, theory. Right. I mean, I, it's a reason I like. I like, but also I could say that you don't even have to accept that. You might say that the, you kind of like the illusion and that you think, that, and there's no reason why you shouldn't you know, enjoy the illusion. And in fact, um, Nicholas Humphrey has written a, a lovely book about um, uh, from an illusionist perspective. He's wary of the label but he it is from an illusionist perspective it's a book called soul dust mm. a lovely book which i like very much and um yeah m- he my cartesian this illusion is fantastic i have a great show <laughs> so yeah. i'm happy to sit in the and he, <laughs> and he thinks that yeah he thinks it's been sculpted this illusion by natural selection for beneficial effects it makes us more it takes it makes us take a more, a, a more vivid interest in life and in the world around us um so he thinks it's very adaptive. Whether we should try and see through the illusion, I don't know. I mean, maybe for some purposes we should, some purposes we shouldn't. When we definitely should try to see through it, I think, is when we're doing science, when, when we're, we're doing, doing 
when we're doing theories of consciousness, we shouldn't go looking, say, for the neural correlates mm -hmm. of this, of qualia. Because it would be like saying, you know, what are the physical correlates of psychokinesis? It doesn't make any sense. There isn't any psychokinesis. All there is is some kind of trick that makes people believe there's psychokinesis. So you can look for the neural mechanisms that cause people to think that they have uh, phenomenal properties and to react as if they do. Yeah, that's an interesting project. But trying to look for the correlates of the thing itself is... So there we, you know... Uh, when we're doing science, when we're doing philosophy of consciousness, we, we need to uh, detach ourselves from, from the illusion. Yeah. So, yeah, th this is where I wanted to turn it to maybe the scientific um, avenues that this way of thinking could potentially go as far as concrete, uh, as you're saying, like make predictions in the world and actually somehow be falsifiable in some way. Um, because so back to that initial question of the ways the ways to talk about something maybe this is just philosophy of science stuff um i think it's a it's an amazing capacity of science to when you fully can intricately explain something and you have the explanation for it and you use language to explain it and your explanation is so complete it will inherently and always make predictions in the world i'm thinking something like charles darwin explaining the variety of biological diversity on earth and coming up with this very elegant explanation which of course was not complete but but quite good mm -hmm. it it demanded it made a, a prediction that something like dna must exist even though he mm -hmm. never mm -hmm. saw or predicted that word in particular we're doing this now mm -hmm. in sort of cosmology with like well there's this thing card called dark matter and dark energy we don't have a good explanation mm -hmm. for it yet but if we describe mm -hmm. its effects its effects back to your word so well mm -hmm. and so perfectly that we could predict it we will be sort of by process of elimination, almost like you can picture a view of like narrowing in and science being like you're looking in a dark room and the thing must be here. It's like coming across mm -hmm. a crime scene and putting it together and trying to find the murder weapon and, event, and through all of your clues at the, at the moment that you have the full explanation and you're about to pull the drawer open and see the bloody knife and you're 99.9% .9 sure it's there and you pull it out and you found it, you've done good science. So in consciousness... And, and it's why this entire endeavor is important. I know consciousness conversations can be maddening for some people, but it's why it's important. And, and I respect your work greatly for fighting this fight against the sort of the, the realism and even my intuitions. Um, what, what can we do with this? Because I'm still struggling with if, if, if I say, great, this, this notion that it's intrinsic is an illusion and, and I'm fully on board and I'm in the world now, and, and we're sort of um, tying ourselves to the effects of the thing is really the thing. It's almost a phenomenological yeah. sort of, the effects of the thing are the thing and, you, and, and questions beyond the effects and, and the phenomenal appearance of a thing is um, a, a little nonsensical and maybe non-scientific. So, you know, whatever, fun, but not going to help us do any work. Mm -hmm. um, great, uh, are we still, tr it seems that, um, we're, we're stuck with self-reported evidence still. Am I still getting hung up on that of, of something like it's, I, I, I guess I'm keep going back to that philosophical zombie. Am I still stuck just saying, well, if it reports pain, then that's good enough. And it's, if I can measure the nerves, you know, firing off in all these kind of ways that it, it is experiencing pain because there is nothing else that pain could be other than this collection of effects that, I, as an experimenter of one on myself, know is this thing that we call pain. And even if it's an illusion, it's a very crappy one and it comes along for the ride. <laughs> and, so, and so this robot out there or this animal or whatever you're affecting on it or whatever, you measure all the effects and you're like, well, pain is there. And now you've completely said the thing you need to say. I don't know. I feel like I still am. Something still feels in, trapped inside other minds that I can't well, quite get through. Let's. I mean, we need to be careful with the word like pain. I mean, I, I'm happy yeah. to say that people have pains. Of course, they have pains in the everyday sense. It's whatever's going on when <laughs> you're doing that. When I, you know, when you when you stub your toe and you do that, that's pain. Mm -hmm. Whatever's happening there, I'm resisting a certain picture of pain as something that's essentially private. I want to cash out pain in terms of a lot of sensitivities and reactions, sensitivities to damage to your own body and reactions to those. And I think that when you spell out that picture in enough detail, that's you've captured everything. You don't need to posit something um, 
essentially private and uh, ineffable uh, in, in the middle of the sandwich, as it were. Now, so when I use words like pain and so on, I'm using them in that way. I think what we need to do is exactly what Daniel Dennett recommended back um, uh, uh, 30 years ago in uh, Consciousness Explained. We need mm-hmm. to focus not on phenomenology, but on heterophenomenology, on all the overt signs and indications mm. of what it's like for you. We, 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 absolutely, we, we ask people what it's like. What, what was that like? And tell us in as much detail as you can. You know, uh, but, you know, introspect, use whatever you know, methods that um, uh, you, you like. Tell us all about them. Let us do experiments on you. Let's, evo- let's, let's um, uh, elicit all kinds of reports from you and let's make detailed um, uh, 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 drop detailed inventories of all the things that you want to say about 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 this. Uh, yeah, so we do all that, and that's our data. That's what needs explaining. How come whatever was happening to you produced all that? Now, one theory is, you know, so you say things like there was this. Uh, I can't explain it. There was this just, just pure awfulness that was happening you know, it was just awful and I was just reacting I can't describe it and it was ineffable and it didn't it, it, you know and if you reflect on it more you might say it didn't, didn't seem like something physical at all it was just this pure pain that was seemed to be okay that's interesting that's how it seemed to you that's that's your report good now let's see what was actually happening what was actually causing those reports now one response is to say there was those reports are absolutely accurate there was this strange mysterious awfulness that was somehow produced in you somehow we don't know where we can't doesn't show up on brain scans doesn't, you know, we can't detect it from a third person point of view but it was real and that was what was causing it and now we need to do some sort of metaphysics to try and find a place for that in the in our picture of reality or you can say well let's just look and see what brain processes produced all those reports and reactions in you and it's exactly again the, the, it's analogous with this situation in the theater we can say we can ask every the audience what they think what they saw what the effect did that show have on you um what did you think you saw and what did what emotions did your seeing it did it provoke fear and surprise and wonder and all this kind of thing did it provoke puzzlement and so on and so forth and, uh, we and then we try and think how did the magician the illusionist do that how did he create that impression one way to create it is by actually having psychokinetic powers and displaying them <laughs> but there are <laughs> there are other uh, easier <laughs> ways of doing it well they're, they're not totally, they're not that easy they're actually quite quite tricky but <laughs> ways that are much more mundane ways of doing it fishing, fishing wire and all kinds of uh, magician tricks. yeah sometimes very clever sometimes rather disappointing when you find them and magnetic i think this is ex- a lot anyway i like magic a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and so I mean, this is one thing that i think people feel when they uh, when you when they look at the sort of neuroscience, mm. I mean, neuroscience is wonderful, amazing, astonishing stuff, but they still sort of feel it's kind of, it, it's not wonderful enough to be the base, to be all that's going on. It's that can't, their private inner world can't really just be that stuff. It's, this, there must be something extra. And this is, of course, the reaction that we always have when we find out how a trick is done, how an illusion is done. It always seems disappointing that, to find out, when we see a trick, we always want to know how it's done. Yeah. And we're always dis- always disappointed because it's never wonderful enough to to match the impression that was created on us. Mm. Um, and uh, well, that so I, I, I just want to like I mean that might be a temperament thing. That's beautiful. I mean, I love I love magic. I've been watching magic <laughs> my whole life, and I'm a huge fan of Penn and Teller. Um, <laughs> and, and they have this wonderful show, show, Fool Us, if you've seen it, where people come on and do. Uh, magic tricks and then they try to figure it out and they use code because there is this sensitivity about revealing it because some people are like I don't want to know in in fact sometimes they show people in the audience like covering their ears like I don't want to hear the (laughs) explanation right because they want to retain and it might be a temperament thing and as you were talking there I was actually feeling that this is rather uh, it's it's a rather illusionism as a as a uh, stance is a rather beautiful way again connecting us closer to the world mm. we actually find ourselves in mm. where um, where you you 
notice and want to proclaim from the top of the mountain that no, the universe itself is this profoundly beautiful, magical thing. And in, in, like, look what it can do. It can create these effects, mm -hmm. exactly. in, in, including the exactly. effect of feeling this beautiful, like you were saying, well, it could be awfulness or, or awe yeah. or wonder. Um, yep. And and that it, w when it comes to magic, I actually I if you can get into that mindset of how incredible it is to yep. produce these effects in the audience of I mean, some magic is actually gorgeous. I mean, it, magic has mm -hmm. this, well, a lot of us has the, have the silly like, you know, card tricks and clowns or whatever. Some of it and some people are doing some very beautiful artistry with magic where they tell very emotional stories. And almost always Penn and Teller famously always show how the trick is done at the end of their tricks and included in it to do this. Mm -hmm to actually point towards maybe it's an atheistic sort of stance of like, mm -hmm. no, the trick itself is what is incredible because look what we can do to each other to produce these yeah. effects without yeah. invoking the metaphysical, without, you know, Harry Houdini yeah. famously is another one of these magicians who who um, told everybody how the trick was done. And, and yeah. uh, you know, I don't know if that's a temperament thing or that's part of your fight, but it, it, there almost does seem to be a um, pseudo-religious resistance to reality in the in the realist camp to demand that soul stuff is somehow um outside of the universe uh yeah you know, yeah if I i'm being that. too I, mean if i'm being too mean to my <laughs> to, 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 <laughs> to the realists out there i don't know but yeah no i i i, I love that what you just said and I, that is as i say kind of ethical considerations um sort of aesthetic considerations really shouldn't play too much of a role in this I don't think but I do warm to that perspective for the reasons you said and I think it, it, it just saying wow well, look you know there's this it's just fun it's, it's just a fundamental property of the universe that there's this there's this what it is likeness and that's it you know we can't say any more about it it's just there and its atoms have got it and it's somehow built that seems to me a very again I don't want to be to be uh, to be to be rude to to, yeah. to to realists but it seems to me a kind of an inspiring position mm -hmm. to say, well, we can't explain it. We've just got to take it as fundamental and that's it. So I think you can hear me um, gaining a little more confidence that I understand exactly what the theory is and what the claims are here. And so in part two, with that confidence, I start to wander into a bit more of the moral and scientific implications of illusionism. Keith and I wonder about the costs of clinging or continuing to cling to the illusion of phenomenal consciousness as something that demands explanation in somehow being real. And we also forecast a possible retreat by humans to a more primitive insistence on our specialness with the rise of conscious machines uh, or even an alien invasion. Uh, we get into the classic free will debate and again, circle back to entrenched misunderstandings and failed conversations about free will. We wander into some areas with implications for animal consciousness as well, and generally brainstorm about the role of philosophers and philosophy in society, and how we might bring these conversations to the public in meaningful and accessible ways. So uh, stick around for part two, uh, it's coming out in a week, and until then, enjoy the magic show of the universe.